I've opened up Atom. Let's add in the project folder and have a look at the package.json. The main script in a package.json is the start script, and we use this to start an express-based dev server. This is more flexible than using Webpack's built-in dev server because we can easily add in REST endpoints, WebSocket servers, proxies, or GraphQL servers. Let's take a look at the dev server. We import Express, then have middleware for Webpack and for hot loading. Next, we'll start our dev server with npm start and refresh the browser. And now I'm going to open up app.js. And that's our entry component. I'm going to delete these counters because they're a bit distracting. Hit save. And then hot loading refreshes the page. So let's have a look at our Webpack config. And uh, Webpack is our bundler. And so that's what takes uh, all of our code and uh, munges it together into a single bundle and uh, minifies it so that it doesn't take up too much bandwidth when it's downloading. So you can see in here that I'm defining two functions, uh, if prod and if dev. And uh, the Webpack config in Webpack 2 is uh, a function that accepts an environment variable. And uh, then you can decide basically uh, what you want to do based on that environment variable, if it's production or if it's development or if you're testing. And previously it was advised in Webpack that you would often have uh, different configs for kind of development and production and things like that. But now that we actually have a function that we can use, uh, then we really just need one uh, Webpack config. And so uh, we've got these uh, entry points and uh, you know the, I've defined two entry points here. Uh, one is, uh, you can see it's got our index.json in and that's going to trace out our application. That's the, the parts of the code that we're writing. And then I've got this second dependency called vendor. And these are the third party libraries that we're using, Babel Polyfill, uh, React and React DOM. And by packaging our vendor libraries together, we ensure that they wouldn't have to be reloaded uh, too often as we update our app, which will probably uh, vary more frequently. So these vendor files can be uh, shared between pages in our, in our web, web application. Um, then we've got our, our output, which is defining uh, the file naming conventions for our bundle, uh, and that's our JavaScript files, and also our source maps. And uh, let's have a look here. So um, just a word on kind of uh, source maps. Let's see if we can find them. So uh, yeah, so line 60. Um, these are our source maps. And you can see that this uh, they depend on whether we're in environment production or uh, if we're in any other environment, dev. And uh, in production, we're going to create a source map file. And in development, we're going to evaluate our source maps on the fly. So let's try commenting out this line and uh, see what happens when we have no source maps. So I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to restart this uh, server. And uh, then I am going to go back into app and I am going to throw an error. I'm going to reload that. And now let's bring up some dev tools. So I'm going to inspect. And uh, you can see I've got an error here. Um, I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. So if I click on this error, it says it's in bundle.js. And as you can see, I'm looking at now at my my uh, sort of compiled with uh, Webpack code. So it's not really that easy to understand, though I can make out quite a bit that, uh, you know, it says it's on line 273 and everything is in one file. So um, let's go uh, back into here. Let's find our Webpack config and uh, comment this line back in and save it, and then bring up our terminal again, and now restart. And it says we've got an error again, this time on app line nine. And that's actually where the error is. And you can see that when we view our source, we're viewing the original file, and we're viewing it before compilation, so we can see all our JSX, and we can see all our ES6 as we wrote it. 
So now I'm going to have a look at using source maps with production. First, let's have a try without source maps. So I'm going to comment this line out again, hit save, and uh, then I am going to run the build and run the build using Webpack. So uh, give that a go. And uh, that's output two files, uh, bundle minus app.js and uh, bundle minus vendor.js. And if we look, at, have a look in this uh, HTML file indexed uh, dist HTML, then you can see that's loading in the uh, bundle vendor first and then the bundle app. And uh, I'm just going to spin up my dev server again. Uh, so npm start. And this time I'm going to load index.dist into my browser. And again, we get that error. And so I'm going to click on that. And you can see now, because our source code has been minified, everything is all on one line. So we've got no way of tracking down errors uh, in production. So I'm back in webpack.config.js, and I'm going to comment this line back in. And uh, then I'm going to save it. And we're going to run our build again. Uh, so you can see that this time it's output four files, uh, bundle and app.js. But again, we've got these uh, source map files here. So uh, let's start up our dev server again. And uh, reload the page. So we get our error again, but here you can see it's correctly picked out that it's on uh, app.js line nine. And I click this and you can see that it's showing us the correct line again where our error occurred. And uh, if we have a look in our source, uh, you can see that all our source is on one line, but then on the second line, it's got a reference to our source map. And this is really cool because it means that uh, you can have your source maps in production and these source map files are, are megabytes big, you know, uh, but they won't be loaded in until somebody opens up the console and uh, and uh, there's an error and they click on the error and then they can go to that line. And so it means that uh, when something goes wrong in production, we can have much better error reporting.